Tell you what, never mind. You guys have missed it. Go to 1 Samuel 20, because we're going we're gonna to linger in 1 Samuel 20. If I get you in Ephesians and the New Testament, I may never get you back into the Old Testament. So let's go to 1 Samuel 20. Good to have you guys. Good to have the Channel View group here today. So many folk from Channel View. Uh, brings back a lot of old memories. Old, I mean old. <laughs> I'm telling you. Why are you flipping that? I'm just going to let you stay seated. We've been talking about connections for the last few weeks, and we'll, we will keep talking about connections over the next uh, coming weeks. Our, our conference title is, is Kingdom Connections, that uh, so many things that happen in, the, uh, in your life are connected to the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Again, uh, when I look at Coach, Coach Vaughn, Clanton, Clanton and I connected in the 80s, but there was a connection through a church that I was a youth pastor in. There's something about those connections. When we have our conference, Pastor Mike Van Britson will be here, but along with him will be a musician by the name of David Huff, of David and the Giants. Now, David, I connected with David through Pastor Mike. So all these connections in your life are so important. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday night, I preached on connections. I dealt with Mary and, and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was pregnant, six months pregnant, when Mary received the news that she was pregnant, and she rushed over to her house, and they, the angel told her about, about uh, Elizabeth being pregnant. Of course, Elizabeth got who? John the Baptist. Mary got Jesus. And the Scripture says when they got together, the baby leaped. David, stand right there. David, jump. That's a jump. When the baby jumps, jump again. See, a jump will just accelerate you. It makes you feel good. It, it, it makes your organs move up and down. But the baby leaped. There's a difference in a jump and a leap. Everybody follow me? All right. Because a lot of times we think, okay, the baby jumped. No, the baby leaped. The, the baby went from the gallbladder to the kidney. Amen. From the kidney to the lung. It, when you leave one, one room, the kitchen to the living room, that's a leap. God will make that happen in your life. Those are connections. And you know when you make the right connections, the babies leap. And that'll tell you something else. The baby's alive in there. Can I get an Amen. Amen. I mean, when you need a truth, just go to the Word of God. That's important, to find truth there. So there was this excitement in Elizabeth's life that she had made a connection. Mary brought her into her circle. By the way, Mary's 15, 16 years old. Elizabeth is probably 70 or older. She's a much older lady. We had a wonderful service in the midweek. Now I want to talk to you about two things. The first, amazing grace. And second, uh, the connections remember. One of the things in life that you're going to find out as you get older, the connections you make are not just for you, but they're for your kids and your kids' kids. They're for friends of people around you. When I'm dead and gone, I pray somebody looks back on my life and says, you know what, I remember your daddy. I had a connection with your daddy, therefore I'm going to do this for you. There's something uh, generational about serving God. When I was younger, I didn't think this way. But as I've gotten older, things begin to shift in my life. Amen. And I believe it is uh, strategic in all of our lives to be connected to the right people. Your blessings always come through people. God will bring blessing into your life. By the way, um, curses will come through people too. Amen. So be careful how you connect and who you connect with. Not everyone has a right to speak into your life. But respect those whom God has connected to you to help you. Wise is the man or woman who fortifies their life with right relationships and connections. The scripture is full of them. And we talked uh, last week, I uh, just mentioned about David and Jonathan, two, two guys in the, in the uh, of course, David is the king. He, he was a young man who killed, he's the giant slayer. He's the one that brought up, uh, 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 that Saul was bringing up. And of course, he ran from Saul. Saul tried to kill him, trying to paraphrase a whole lot of scripture running through my mind. David is running, uh, running away from Saul, again, trying to assassinate him, if you would. He has a young friend by the name of Jonathan. Bring this up, Carol, just a little bit. I'm, I'm yelling up here, and I shouldn't be. Amen. Uh, but there's something about grace. Everybody say grace. grace. Pastor Mike and I spoke about it this morning on my way here. My pastor, who's up in Illinois, we speak. Second Corinthians tells us, and listen, grace, my friend, it is the anointing of God. And the anointing of God is simply a heavenly approval, unction. It's God on flesh doing those things that flesh cannot do. That's the unction. That's, that's, that's uh, 
Samson pushing over the pillars. That's the unction of God. That's, that's Peter walking on the water. It's the unction of God. That's that anointing. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The whole issue there is that God gets the glory for your life. That God is working in you and through you and blessing through you. There are many thoughts on grace. There's some say, you know, when you see a ballet dancer dancing, that, that, that is grace. We say grace at meals. It's, it's praying over and giving God thanks for the food. So-and-so brought grace when they came. There are certain people that will bless you when they come in. It's just like they brought peace in the house. They bless you. How many know some people bless you when they show up? Some people bless you when they leave. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Simply stated, you can't do this on your own. That grace is, is is a divine thing from God. God does this. I can't work for it. I work from it. I'm blessed because of it. But grace is a powerful thing. Grace is unmerited favor, extending special favor to someone who doesn't deserve it, who hasn't deserved it, who hasn't earned it, and can never repay it. Now, let me just say this about grace to you. First, this is what happened for us. God did this for us. We didn't earn the grace, amen. But here's on the flip side, there are times that people will trespass against us and we give them grace. We love them through it. They may not have deserved it. They, they don't earn it. Amen. Uh, but, and, and they can never repay it. But we give them grace. This is what God did for us. This is amazing to me. This is why I call it. It's called amazing grace. Amen. There ain't nothing more amazing than that. So even as Jonathan, as we start walking through this Old Testament thought in 1 Samuel 20, David's covenant with Jonathan was to show unfailing kindness, grace to him because of his family. David would have been killed had it not been for Saul's son, Jonathan. He knows that. Jonathan protected him, looked after him, and loved him. I said to you on the midweek, there was nothing immoral about David and Jonathan's relationship. They loved like brothers love. They had this care for one another. There are times in life, I will tell you, even as a man, your baby will leap. As a man, you will get around another brother and your baby will leap. There'll be something, there, there's a connection to them, there's a blessing about them. They're, they're, it's like you found, a, a, they're not blood, but spiritually they become your brothers. Amen. You connect with them. There's something exciting about that. And that's what happened in the life of David. David's covenant with Jonathan was so important, it was unfailing kindness. So even as Jonathan's father, Saul, the king, sought to kill David in his jealousy, it all started with the death of a giant and a song. David has killed his thousands. Uh, excuse me, Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his ten thousands. There's something about a jealousy that rose up in Saul, and he tried to take David out. So as he's beginning to prepare himself to whether or not to run, 1 Samuel 20, verse 12 says, Then Jonathan said to David, By the Lord, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out my father. In other words, I want to know his intentions. By this time, the day after tomorrow. And if he is favorably disposed toward you, will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father is inclined to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely. If I do not let you know and send you away safely, may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. But show me unfailing kindness. That is the Old Testament word for grace. Unfailing kindness. Show me unfailing kindness. Jonathan speaking, like that of the Lord as long as I live so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut me off from the kindness from my father. Uh, from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of God, saying, May the Lord God, may the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. Father, I thank you for the word of God. Now, Lord, I ask you to take my mind, which is so running everywhere, bring it together, let the word of God speak. Share with us what you want us to hear today. And may it affect our lives throughout the rest of this week. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. We have two guys, Jonathan and David. Jonathan recognizes, though he is the king's son, that he should get the kingdom by right. But then he also knows that God is fixing to take his dad out and put David in. 
Now, this is going to cause some problems in the kingdom of Israel. So in order to put David in, Saul and Jonathan have to die. Jonathan recognizes that, and he says to David, David, if something happens to us, promise me that you'll take care of my family. Promise me that the unfailing love that you put on me will be toward my family. So it was the custom at that time that in the Eastern dynasties that when a king took over, all the family members of that previous dynasty were, was, were exterminated so that they could be no longer a revolt. David, you brought up a point when you talked about this woman who came through and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. She broke protocol. There are times that connection breaks protocol. It may be a protocol that all the family be destroyed and everybody die in order for this one king to come up pure. But there was one young boy. His name was Mephibosheth. Everybody say Mephibosheth. That's a tough word, isn't it? Say it one more time. Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was... Uh, Jonathan's little boy. And when this happened, when, the, when, when Saul was killed, when Jonathan was killed, matter of fact, Saul took his own life in a cowardly suicide, if you will. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4 says, Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel about their death. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell and became crippled. His name was Mephibosheth. David, after years of peace, and this happens in your life. You start having peace. Things start being good. Favor starts coming your way. You're no longer struggling like you once were. Amen. And you get into a place in life, and you sit back, and you think to yourself, I wonder who I can be a blessing to. Say that with me. I wonder who I can be a blessing to. Come on, say it again. I wonder who I can be a blessing to. In other words, who can I show grace to in my life? And then you start remembering back. And David starts remembering the fondness he had for Jonathan. The fact that I believe they hunted together. They warred together. They learned together. They fought together. They, they had so much about them. They had this camaraderie. And now he's thinking about Jonathan's death and he's gone. I too, this week, began to think about that. I held hands with two sweet little ladies from this church in this house right here who are passing from this life. I remembered going back and thinking about two 16-year-old boys in our other campus who both died a year apart from cancer. I think about life and how that it's not fair. That one gets to maybe get all the way up in age and then the other ones to go real young. And I, I, I say, God, I, I don't know, but I do know this. You have favored my life. You have graced my life. It is unmerited. It ain't fair. I should not be where I'm at today. But you've blessed me the way you've blessed me. You've looked after me the way you've looked after this country boy. Amen. I got to find somebody to be a blessing to. Amen. I want to be graceful. So David asked the question. Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan, Jonathan's sake. Is there anyone? Grace doesn't ask, is there anyone qualified or is there anybody worthy? It just says, is there anyone? And this guy spoke up and said, there is still a son of Jonathan. Now, hold on. In other words, you knew that Jonathan had a son, but you kept it quiet. I think it was Zeba. I think it was his name. You kept it quiet. You kept this thing quiet until you could say something about it. Because had you said it beforehand, that young boy would have been killed. Because he's a part of the lineage of Saul. But you kept it quiet. But you waited till that moment of grace. Everybody say grace. grace. When everything was right. Sometimes, you ever get on yourself for talking too quick? <laughs> you ever say to yourself, I wish I hadn't have said that? I wish I could have drew that back? That has been in my life, my whole life. I say to myself at times, you shouldn't have said that. You didn't have to say that. And so here's Zeba keeping this thing quiet for years. Because I, I, I don't know. I tried to look it up to try to find. How old is Mephibosheth now? How old was he when David found him? I believe he's probably a young man. But either way, he's been, he's been hid out. He's been, uh, he escaped. He stayed in a place. The Bible says there is a young man. His name is Mephibosheth. In the Hebrew language, Mephibosheth, one who scatters shame, a laughingstock, a shameful thing. I saw a picture yesterday, and again, I am a college football fan, where a young boy, a young boy, had no money, went to school because it was where the jersey of your, of your favorite team to school. He did not have a University of Tennessee shirt. 
So he took a piece of paper and he wrote UT on the paper and he scribbled it out on the paper and the kids laughed at him. They made fun of him because he didn't have an orange shirt. He didn't have a, a T on his shirt. He made his own shirt and pinned it on it and went to school. He went home crying and saying they, they, they picked on me, they hurt me. And when the University of Tennessee found out about it, they sent him all the, what do you call that when you get that stuff? Apparel swag. They sent him a swag bag full of T-shirts, everything to make every kid in that school envy because he got the latest and the greatest. But not only did they do that, they took the design that he scribbled onto that piece of paper, UT, and they designed a brand new T-shirt for the University of Tennessee. And I thought, that's how you do it, man. You take somebody who was a laughing stock and put down. And that's how Mephibosheth felt. He crawled through life. He pressed himself through. If he got up on crutches or had a chair or somebody had to pick him up to take him from point A to point B, they laughed at him. They put him down. You should have been the king. You were Jonathan's son. You're the only one living. But shh. Because if somebody finds out, they'll kill that boy. Because you understand dynasties. So Mephibosheth was hid away. And as a matter of fact, the scripture says, and, and the question, again, grace is not picky. It didn't say, uh, David just simply said, where is he? Where is this boy? Not how bad is he. Right. Not, not how did this happen. I remember when we adopted our first child, Mandy. I'll never forget this. I got a phone call saying there was a little girl who was 11 months old that needed parents. I was playing golf uh, south of Mobile, Alabama with another preacher from Citronelle, Alabama. I was about on the ninth or tenth hole, if I remember correctly, when the phone call came and said that there's a little girl that needs parents. Uh, now, I may have this a little bit wrong. I just remember I, could, I didn't get to finish playing golf. <laughs> I never asked the question, is she red? Is she yellow? Is she black? Is she white? Can she walk? I didn't ask no questions. I just knew there was a little girl that needed parents. Let me tell you, grace is not picky. It says I'll take whatever God gives me when God blesses me with it. And I was hungry for a child, and God has blessed me since then. And I can tell you again, over and over again, it wasn't about us adopting her. She adopted us. I've always felt that about my kids. I was the one that needed adopting. I'm the one that had this, this need for to be filled. Mephibosheth, here he is. Amen. Grace is one-sided. The grace that God has extended toward us and accepting us as his sons and daughters. We didn't deserve it. God didn't look down here and say, are you texting? Huh? Uh, uh, do, you, do, you live, do, you, do you live in finery? Do, do you drive a... Uh, I'll leave that alone. I picked on Chevy so much, you know. But, but, but the bottom line is simple. God looked down to all of us and said, my grace is extended to whosoever will. Amen. Amen. If you accept it, there it is. It looked like judgment, but then came grace. Let me tell you over our own lives. The boy was five years old. Five years old when the nurse fell on him and broke. You know, five is the number of grace. Grace is something about grace. There's something about knowing that grace is in your life. 2 Samuel 9, 3, the king asked, is there, is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness or grace to? Ziba answered the king, oh, there's still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he's at the house of Make, our son of Emil in Lodabar. When you look up the word Lodabar, that name, man, ever since I heard it years ago, it means barren pasture. It's, it's, it's uh, unimaginable desolation. It's dryness, no rain, little life. You know, you know where grace really works in you? When you're dry, when you ain't been to church in years, when life it seems depleting. Amen. When it feels like everything's wasted and all of a sudden grace washes over you, it's like the morning rains and brings forth life again. It's grace. Everybody say grace. Amen. Amen. There's something about it. Uh, Mephibosheth, I was a king's kid. I was living in luxury. I was doing well. And now I'm hiding for my life. My legs no longer work. My grandpa ruled Israel. Now I'm an outcast in Lodabar. I have no self-esteem. Listen to what Mephibosheth said about himself. In, in verse 8, chapter 9. 
9. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is, is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? When he came to pick him up, why does he even want a dead dog? And I've listened to people with low self-esteem, beating yourself up, talking about where you came from, the addictions, the problems, uh, the, the divorces, uh, all these things, and you just beat yourself uh, down, uh, and keep yourself, quit! Stop! You are a king's kid. And you may look like you live in a dry place, but that grace is extended to you and to I. Amen. And we got connections. The whole issue of Mephibosheth was a kingdom connection. That David was connected to his daddy, Jonathan. And because of that moment, there was an understanding. I got to bring him together. This was despite Mephibosheth's low self-worth, handicap, and shame brought to him by his grandfather's sins, the defeat, and the resulting suicide. Mephibosheth, the king wants to see you. Excuse me? The king wants to see you. Now, Whenever you have a lack of information, right. <laughs> it can bring not only frustration, but fear into your life. When you hear the word, the principal wants to see you. Right. Now, I know today in the school system, when the principal wants to see you, usually that means to be buddies. When I was in school, and you heard the word, the principal wants to see you, that was never good news. The king, <laughs> even if my mother said, your dad needs to talk to you. Oh, God. <laughs> that is not good news. The king, well, can, can you divulge any more information here? Can you help me a little bit? Because I can't, I promise you, Mephibosheth felt, they found me. They know me. They're going to kill me. They're going to make sure that I'm not a part of the dynasty no more. They're going to take me away. There's something about that. But here's David with, with, with a face of grace. That's why you've got to look in the Old Testament and realize there are New Testament principles being carried out in the Old Testament. It shows us that. Fear and death, Mephibosheth prostrated before the king. 2 Samuel 9, verse 6. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. Amen. That's smart, boy. Humble yourself. David said to, to Mephibosheth, your servant replied, you Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness. I promise you, this boy was waiting on the pulling of the sword, the death of his life, and David said, I will show you kindness, what? For the sake of your father, Jonathan, I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Somebody say connections, remember. Listen, you're not always going to be here. Your children are going to come in behind you. Your grandkids are going to come behind them. And what you want in life is a connection that remembers. They, in, in, in life, you need that more than anything. Yet you don't know what you're doing now, how it's going to affect something later. How you have somebody that's downcast now, how it's going to come back to you later. Jonathan just looked at David and he said, listen, I'm going to tell you, God is going to take this uh, kingdom away from my daddy. I understand that. And I should be jealous. I should be mad. I should be upset. But the bottom line is, sir, you carry the favor of God. You've got the blessings of God. And I know, so this is what I'm going to ask. And I will tell you this. There are times in life you may not feel like you've got the blessings or the favor. Find somebody that does and connect with them. And that's what Jonathan did. And when Jonathan died on the battlefield, here's David moving through life, becomes king like he's, David's got his own kids. He's got Amnon. He's got Absalom. He's got Tomorrow, he, I think I read that David had like uh, six, eight, ten. I mean, he got a lot of children. But he wanted one more. Bring that boy into this house. Bring him up in here. Now, I promise you, when he come into that house, and he's on either his crutches, and they could hear him coming into that dining hall, and there come all the sons and daughters of David sitting at that table, and that boy pulled himself up under that table, Come on up. Just uh, there was something, something blessing about all that. Here he comes in, and uh, a laughing stock. They mocked me, they laughed at me, but they didn't know I was a king's kid. I didn't realize and carry it as a king's kid. And he gets ready to come in to the into the room, and he knows at this moment I, I, I figured I'd be dead, but David. In grace and mercy remembered. Somebody say remembered. 
they're all sitting around the table. That first awkward moment when you walk into that room and you can hear the crutches coming down the hall of that marble floor. And as he walks in, he looks at the people and he throws the crutches down and he slides up under the table. You, you know the great thing about grace? And this is what I love, I love, I love, I love. It puts us all at the same level. There's no big eyes. There's no little U's. We all right here. Grace, unmerited. You didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. We didn't deserve it. It was unmerited. It just came on our life because we asked God for it. And he sat there. And I could see Ammon and Tamar and Absalom and Joab, the commander, and David, David sitting and they're looking at the new kid. Yeah, listen, church world. That's a time we all family, we all doing stuff together. And all of a sudden, the new kid comes in. Y'all know anything about that new kid? You said new dude in the back, sitting in the church. Y'all know anything about him? Huh? So, what is God asking you to do? Connect. Connect with him, with the new one. And there he is, eating with him. Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. David looked at him. He said, this is Jonathan's boy. Now, all the other boys, they know. Y'all should have killed him. He's a threat. David said, I ain't. Grace took the threat away. Amen. You love, he's my son now. I look after him. A couple of years ago, my son got in some trouble. Many of you know. And it's not about the preacher talking about his kids. But he had a low time. Just a low time. I won't go into all of it other than say this. He was on his way to this church on a Tuesday night. He trying to, he trying to do the right thing. You know what it's like when you're trying to do the right thing. And then all of a sudden everything starts falling against you. So he's on his way here. And he gets pulled over by a police officer speeding. His fault. He comes to the church. David, you remember this? He's sitting back here in the back. I go up to him, and he, when your kid loses it, you lose it. Yeah. And he lost it. He starts crying. He said, Dad, I'm trying to do the right thing. I can't seem to get on top of it. He said, everything going downhill? I said, all right, I understand. You, and, and I can't, I don't want to embarrass him, so I'm not going to tell you all the things that happened. But it, it, it's just like, it was like dominoes in his life, just bad, bad, bad. So the cop gives him a ticket. And he said, I don't know what to do. And I said, it's okay. okay. So I'm heading home. And I'm heading out through Huffman. I saw a state trooper's car parked at a Shell gas station. I don't know if this is him. I just know this is the vicinity. So I whooped in there real quick. I sat on the hood of my car. Right next to his cop car. And he comes out. And I looked at him and I said, excuse me. Did you give my son a ticket tonight? Now, how do you know that was stupid already? <laughs> and he said to me, did your son deserve a ticket tonight? Who? I said, oh. Uh, and I mentioned his name. He said, yeah, I gave him a ticket. I said, yeah, he deserved it, sir. He deserved a ticket. He deserved jail. He deserved whatever you said. But I, I, I said, I, I'm just here to ask you, is there anything we can do about it? He looked at me and he said, you that preacher. I said, excuse me? He said, you that preacher. He said, you got Rodney's old purple 71 Challenger, don't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, you got Rodney's ashes in the Challenger, don't you? you see, if you don't know this... I helped a man who, who went through a terrible struggle of alcohol and, and uh, divorce and everything. I, I'd mow his grass when he was drunk and passed out. I, lo I looked after him. He came to our churches when I was pastor in Crosby Church here at the little country church. He's my friend. I was with him in the hospital when nobody else would come and see him. He, he's dying. And he looked at me and he told me about this old car. And I bought the car from him. I wouldn't take it from him. I had to buy it from him. I said, I can't take that car. I love hot rods. You know it, man. I got a purple charger. I said, I got to buy it. And he said, okay, it'll cost you a dollar. I gave him a dollar. I anted up. It's a good deal. 
It's a good yes. deal. Yes. When he died, I got my dollar back. Because I'm the one that did the funeral. and had to take care of all of his stuff. You're sitting in a building that the down payment of this building came through this man's house. Through the connections of mowing his grass and loving on him when he was passed out. You don't know how connections work. But this cop was Rodney's friend. And when I said to him, when he said to me, you knew Rodney? You got Rodney's ashes in your car? I said, because that's what he wanted. He wanted to ride in the car. Now he's riding in the car. So, yeah, his ashes are in the car. And he said, uh, let me tell you, because of your kindness toward my friend in the hardest times of his life, do you have that ticket? Yes, sir. I do. He said, let me have it. He took that ticket and he tore it in half. And he said, I got this. Oh, my God. Connections remember. Connections remember. Grace is such a powerful thing. And when you give grace to people, grace comes back to you. Some of you think... You forgot all the things you've done in life. You forgot all the blessings. And you've gotten mad. I'm going to tell you, when we're dead and gone, our connections are going to remember. My hope is that someday when I'm gone, somebody will say, I remember your pop. And there'll be a remembrance. I want us to live in such a way to remember our connections and to have grace one toward another. Heads bowed for a moment, eyes closed. Father, ain't nothing stronger than your grace. It changes lives of men and women. It affects our spirits. It just begins to work on us. It reminds us to be kind toward others. Lord, there's no God like you. There's nothing like Christianity. Jesus, you portrayed it in your kindness toward others. Constantly reaching, connecting. They remember. Your disciples remembered you and how you did things. Peter remembered how you cast people out of a room and prayed over people, raised them from the dead. Connections, remember. My prayer in this house is we as a people will remember connections like David did for Jonathan. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, can I ask you if you need grace today? You need grace today? Just put your hand up. I've been away from God. I just love God. I need grace today. Just put your hand up. Hands all over the building. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I ask you to forgive me, cleanse me, wash me. God, help me to be kind toward others. And when I'm gone, may it be remembered in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God a praise in this house. Amen. I can't remember a time that I started a sermon so rough and ended it so well. <laughs> Can I be honest with you? Jesus put a face on grace. We never knew what grace looked like until Jesus showed up. And then when he showed up, that face said something. Many of us have been involved in feudal lives and living for ourselves. They ain't nothing like amazing grace. Amen. Nothing like it. If our servant leaders would come up. Amen. David, you can prepare yourself here. Let me just mention one thing to you. This Thursday night, this is our connection week. Okay, now the next few weeks are connections. Uh, connect groups on the back wall back there. It's connect groups. What I need is this Thursday it's one of the first connect groups. It's for our men, men's fellowship. And, and teenage young men would like to come to this. But we're going to meet at, in Pecan Meadows in Hardin, Texas. Now, if you don't know where it is, it's, let me see if I got the right name. It's called, Ronnie, Pecan Meadows Skeet or Shooting? I believe it's Shooting. Shooting. You can look it up, Pecan Meadows. Pecan Meadows in Hardin, Texas. We'll start at 7 o'clock. 
If you don't have a shotgun, don't worry about it. We're going to have plenty of guns. Uh, but we are going to shoot skeet. But we're going to have a meeting first. We're going to, uh, I understand we have to eat deer chili. <laughs> Amen. Mm. Uh, so it's going to be a fellowship for us guys. So I know that uh, uh, some are gathering rights. We'll be leaving from the north campus at 6 o'clock, you know, to head out there. It's about a 45-minute plus drive to get there to uh, Hardin, Texas. But, man, I'd love to have you there. It's the round table. We're going we're gonna to share. We're going to talk about connections again. And then, of course, next week there will be more connect groups going on. If you've not signed up for one, sign up for one. Uh, you say, I, I don't know if I, I don't have a Harley. I don't have a Honda. It's okay. If you like motorcycles, you like to talk with, we're going to have a meeting uh, next Sunday, 1 o'clock out at the North Campus. We'll have a meeting first, and I'm sure we'll take a short ride. Our sisters are going to be getting together. Ladies, you're going to have a Las Compadres meeting. Then I think there's another meeting with uh, our speed and our off-road misfits. We're going to be gathering at a big car show over at Valley Ranch. So all these things will be going on over the next few weeks. Those are sign-ups in the back. Eventually, we're going to have a, a, another meeting one month about for, for young couples, strengthening young couples. Amen. So we're going to do different things. And, of course, through the Sundays, we still got SWAP. We still got uh, uh, our, uh, our ladies' meeting. Sister, you run. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Lyft. Amen. Uh, not Uber, but Lyft. Uh, we gather. And our Jewels for Christ. There'll be an advance out at, the, at, at Camp Holy Wild. Ladies, if you've not signed up for that, please sign up. See Diane Spurlock for that. If you're watching online, you, of course, you can give online. There's a place there for you to touch and to give. We appreciate our online givers. If you need to tie the offering envelope, honor the king with your giving this morning. Lift your hands. So there's going to be a TLCC Spark Ladies Min, uh, Ministry that's going to be um, September 21st, and that's going to be a craft day in New Caney. September 27th, as Pastor said, that, that there's going to be a ladies' event with the jewels. See Miss Diane in the back. Um, save the day annual fall conference is going to be Sunday, October 20th through Wednesday, October 23rd. Um, and I believe there it is. Uh, there. It, so these men have not only spoken to our life, but they've spoken to our pastor's life many times when he has he has issues or he has. He, these are the men he goes to. So I promise you, there's tons and tons and tons of wisdom there. Come and you'll be blessed. Again, uh, connect. Just find somewhere that you connect. That's what strengthens the body. Is unity in the body. That's what Christ is coming back for. I, 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 me and Pastor were talking one day, and I, we were just mentioning the fact that Christ is not coming back because the world gets bad. Christ is coming back when the church gets good. That's the reality. So we need to realize that we need to strengthen our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Today we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commissions, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts to mall, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom.